This category of questions and answers measures an oralist's ability to think quickly and effectively to respond to judges' questions. In this appellate-style advocacy contest, it's appropriate for you to ask questions during the oralist presentation. While you will not actually announce which team won or lost at the end of a match, you are acting as one of three judges who will theoretically decide the outcome of the case. Therefore, to earn your favor, successful oralists must respond to what you want to know while conveying what they want to tell you. You should consider the following five points when evaluating questions and answers. The oralist should demonstrate ingenuity and skill in answering questions. Whether you ask an easy question or a difficult question, the oralist should be able to answer it. In addition to questions about the case, judges may test students' knowledge of fundamental principles of international law, as well as questions that are relevant by way of analogy. Here's an example. Counsel, so I'm, I'm a little puzzled in that we're immediately jumping to trying to figure out what the Security Council is doing, which sounds like we're, you're being asked, and I think this happens on the other side as well, to second guess the Security Council. Why exactly, other than the fact that you've agreed to be here, does this court have jurisdiction at all? It would seem to be the case that this case is, as the Security Council says in that very same resolution, seized of the matter. Why are we seized of it? Your Excellency, that question was addressed by this court in the Turan hostages case. And in paragraph 40, it clearly stated that when the council is seized of the, of the matter in its political aspect, the court can very well be seized of the matter in its legal aspect. And that is precisely what we put forward before the court. And it is also important to note, Judge Alvarez, that in contentious cases before the court, there have been examinations on the legal effect of Security Council resolutions, such as the Lockerbie contentious case, by which the court had to analyze effects of council resolutions as to determine its jurisdiction over but, the but case. If you pose a hypothetical question or a query that devi deviates from the argument, the oralist should be able to provide you a creative yet relevant response and then bring you back to her argument. The oralist should welcome questions from the judges. Competitors should receive questions with a positive demeanor that demonstrates respect for the judge who asked the question and the importance of the inquiry posed. When an oralist is interrupted with a question, she should not appear surprised, frustrated, or worst of all, irritated. Oralists should be able to build a rapport with the bench, so your question should be regarded as timely and appropriate because it relates to what you need to know in order to be persuaded. The oralist should directly answer the question. Oralists should answer the questions directly and concisely and avoid being evasive or long-winded even if your question is aimed at a weak point in their argument. Here's an example. The period of which Plumland had occupation. So you mean if a country had a global positioning system satellite and discovered an island that nobody had discovered, <laughs> never having touched foot on it, made a symbolic claim, first discovery, they've got it, everybody else is out? No, Your Excellency, we submit that symbolic annexation in the form of taking the territory, planting a flag, and other acts asserting title to that territory. You mean like occupation? Yes, Your Excellency. But this effective occupation, as was done, for instance, by, this, by Spain in relation to Florida, where carvings were in the 15th century were considered to be uh, stating the territory to be, to be Spanish. So we're way past the rule on discovery. We're really now talking about an occupation standard, which we think favors the other side. Yes, Your Excellency, we are talking about an occupation standard, but we do not submit that it favors the other side. Once the expiration of this reasonable period occurs, then yes, Plumland's acts of occupation are valid after that point, leaving them with a period of at most approximately five years of occupation over the island. Jessup judges are testing the oralist ability to provide a credible, persuasive, and direct answer. Competitors should earn points for honestly answering the question, even if the answer is, I'm sorry, Your Excellency, I don't know the answer to your question because I'm not familiar with that case. A direct, on-point response should always be favored over an evasive, non-responsive answer. And if the oralist is able to maintain an air of competence and professionalism with every answer, this is even better. The oralist should make strategic concessions when appropriate. The compromise is written to include weakness on both sides of the case. You may ask a question 
and the accurate answer is not in the oralist's favor. In that case, it may be appropriate and even strategic for the oralist to concede the issue. For example, while an oralist may lose on a sub-issue, she may apply that same logic to show that her side wins anyway, based on an alternative argument, or that the law determining a more important issue is in her side's favor. The oralist should seamlessly tie questions and answers into her argument. Judges will interrupt oralists to ask questions, and it is important for the oralist to demonstrate the ability to relate the question to her argument or transition back to her argument. Such a response shows that the logic of her answer was strong, the question the bench asked was in step with her presentation, and she delivered the clarity the bench wanted so that now everyone is comfortable with moving on. However, oftentimes judges will purposefully ask questions that force the oralist to argue points out of order to determine how effectively she can return to her roadmap or main argument. 